Okay, so those uh, who have attended my last class on uh, bipolarisms and transistor, uh, hopefully uh, uh, one point. That is ultimately uh, <coughs> the concept of transistor is nothing but a journey of electron. Journey of electron from one side of the semiconductor, which is called an emitter, for NP and its electron, for PNP it's a hole. Journey of charge carriers, I should say. The journey of charge carrier from one end, from one side of semiconductor to the other side. So the journey starts at the source end or emitter end and the journey ends at the collector end. So it's all about the journey of charge carriers. During this path, some charge carriers are lost, recombined, <coughs> which gives rise to the base current. Or some charge carriers are lost in the form of recombination. And the rest are hard. So I have asked you one question, okay, since it's a journey of charge carriers or journey of electrons for MPN transistor. So can I simply have a wire? Simply journey of charge carriers from one end of the wire to the other end. This can serve the purpose. Is it is it is it the amplification or rather is it the operation of, of, a, of a transistor? Which we are looking at? No. So the operation of transistor, operation of bipolar junction transistor can be visualized by virtue of this analogy. All of us have encountered this. Yeah. What is the purpose? Control the flow, control the flow right? The control to control the flow. So you have the inlet of water, right? You have the outlet. Now the connection between this inlet and outlet is controlled by a valve. Right? Now if you place the valve at the extreme, say, anti-clockwise direction, anti-clockwise position, this is basically off. If I just forget the leakage, can suppose it's an ideal kind of uh, tap. So that means uh, there is no such leakage. In that case, you should expect that there is no water flow from the inlet to the outlet. Condition, right? On the other hand, if you just place the valve at the extreme clockwise position, then you have the maximum flow. Right? It's another state. One state is off, that means no water flow. Other state, the maximum water flow. And in between what we have, now if we just change the position by some degree, for example, by some angle, then the amount of water, amount of liquid that is flowing out of this tap can be modified. Now what do you expect? You expect that okay, if I change it by say 10 degree, then the amount that is emerging from that, the volume of the liquid, the volume of water, and if I change it from 10 to 20, I should expect the same thing. Or if I change from 10 to 0 to 20 and 0 to 40, you should have a double volume that you should expect. And that is the basic motion of amplification. And it is also known as elevation. And that concept is applied while you visualize the transistor as a device, a device where the flow of charge carrier from the one end to the other end, from the end one to the end two, is controlled by the third terminal. Okay. So we have three such operations over here. One is, uh, these three operations can be combined into two sets. One is known as the switching operation. In switching operation, you have either the device is completely off or the device is completely on. Device is off, that means there is no water flow. That means no current flow. And device on means the maximum current flow, the maximum water that you can have. So these are the two states, but none of these two, two states are our concern. Our concern is the third state. That means if I change the valve position by some amount, 
I would like to have how can I control the switch, right? So small change involved in the third term and the output between the first and the second term. Suppose you have some change, suppose the input is changed by some, some degree or say uh, in, my, in my analogy suppose uh, your input signal is having some fluctuation, some variation, say the magnitude is 0 0.5 and that fluctuation is obtained as, as another fluctuation, say let it be 50. So 0.5 at the input side is uh, observed as 50 in the output side. So we call that, okay, there, there is a gain of 100, 0.5 to 50. And that should be uniform. 0.5 to 50 means what? If your input is 1, that should be 100. If the input is 2, that should be 200. That is called a linear kind of thing. Linear, you have not studied linearity yet. Hopefully you have not studied. Or have, have you studied yet? Yes or no? Linearity is a good theory? You have studied. Supervision theorem? Yes. You have studied. So we will also encounter this one in, in the DC and as well as AC analysis. So that is the basic notion of amplification, right? Analogous behavior. Okay, analogous. So if you can uh, encounter your uh, daily life things with with your with what you are studying uh, in a course, then you can uh, grasp the concept. You can digest the concept in a much better. Right. So that, that is the that is the analogy behind an amplification of or the, rather the transistor operation. So here, although we have uh, two such uh, behavior, one is the switching behavior, digital logic, uh, either zero or one, and the second one is amplification behavior. And in our case, in in this particular course, we will encounter this one. The small change in one uh, terminal will create some maximum change or large change in the other terminal. Amplification. Okay. Now, when it comes to the uh, construction of uh, a bipolar junction transistor BJT, we have there are three terminals. For them, we have not attended my last class. So, we have three terminals emitter terminal, base terminal, collector terminal. Em emitter is heavily doped. So, if I uh, consider NPN, because last day we have discussed NPN transistor. So, this is N plus. This one is N plus. Emitter is heavily doped. And you have the base for which the base region, the width of the base region is the smallest and then you have the, the collector region. Emitter, base, collector. And in case of NPN, what do you expect? Uh, what about the, uh, let me just uh, uh, draw the corresponding symbol so that you can relate. N, P, N. Emitter, base, collector. Okay. For P and P, only the polarity is reversed. P, N, P. So for the emitter, uh, for NP and transistor, both the emitter and collector, they are of N type and base is of P type. Whereas for P and P transistor, the emitter and the Collector, both of them are p-type, but the basis of n-type. Okay, emitter is heavily doped, and the width of the base region is first. Remember, uh, while discussing the n-pin transistor, the operation of transistor in the last day, hopefully you have noticed that uh, ultimately, one is the k injection at the reverse bias p injunction, and second one is what? Second one was? Forward bias and one side is heavily doped, that means uh, asymmetric kind of thing. So basically what happens for NPN transistor, you expect that the, you have so many electrons present over here and the electrons are moving, right, it's crossing this junction and uh, there are some holes present in this base region, there is a recombination and since the electrons are moving, in, you should expect that, what is the direction of the current? Direction should be that side, right the positive current direction towards this side, out of this emitter, out of this. Similarly, for PNP transistor, here you have so many holes present in the emitter side and the holes are crossing this junction, same analogy, holes are crossing this junction, some recombination will take place at the base region. Now, since holes are crossing, so you should expect that that is the positive direction of the current towards the device, towards the device. Okay, 
So this is the direction of current, IE. Suppose I have say 100 such holes crossing the junction. Out of 100 holes, suppose say one hole is recombined over there and rest 19 holes, they are ultimately collected. So your limiter current is having two components. One is the base current component, second current component. So IE is equal to IB plus IC. That is the one KCL that you can apply over there. This, the KCL is, is true for PNP as well as for NPN. Only the direction is different. For PNP, the direction is this word, IE entering and IB and IC they are leaving. And for NPN, it is something like that. You should expect IB over there, the base current. IC current and IE emitter current. Okay. So the condition remaining the same. IE is equal to IB plus IC. Collector current plus base current. Okay. And that is our KCL, Kipchas current law. And what would the Kipchas voltage law? For PNP has been written in terms of PNP, that's why it is equal to VEB plus VBC. Last day we have represented in terms of NPN transistor, that means VCE is equal to VCB plus VBE. Right. And whenever uh, this uh, transistor, either whether it be NPN or PNP, when the transistor is operated as an amplifier, then uh, you must be knowing that base emitter junction is forward pass. And the base capacitance is reverse pass. Right. Forward activity. Jam. Base emitter junction is forward pass and base capacitance is reverse pass. So, what is the condition? That means VPE should be greater than 0 for NPN. For NPN, your base is positive, or base is P type, is of P type, and emitter is of N type. So, VPE should be greater than 0. So, therefore, since 0.7, it should be greater than 0. Right, it should be greater than zero, and since you have a pin junction over there, so that if that I mean that VB on is equal to zero point seven volts for a silicon kind of thing. Okay, silicon transistor. Anyway, and uh, PNP should be less than zero. Right. So let's uh, demonstrate what happens uh, for BJP in so uh, an active mode. VB should be then greater than zero. Yes, that means VB less than zero or VB greater than zero. Or PNP. V, because for PNP transistor, what you have? This is your emitter side. This is the PNP. This is emitter. This is base. This is collector. Here also, this is emitter. This is base. This is collector. This is mentioned already. Emitter, base, and collector, right? So if this junction is forward bias, this junction is forward bias. That means what? VE should be greater than VB. Or in other words, VB should be less than VE. Okay, so for a PNP transistor, you should expect that VEB greater than 0 volt and ECB should be less than 0 volt. And the reverse thing happens for an NPN transistor. VB greater than 0 volt and VBC less than 0 volt. Right? As we have, made, we have established one thing that uh, typically we don't apply any voltage between the collector and base, rather, rather we apply a voltage between the collector and the emitter. Right? And accordingly, the, uh, as you know, this VCE, VCE, I'm writing in terms of your NPN transistor. So VCE is how much? VCB plus VB. <coughs> VB component for NPN transistor, that should be positive. That is positive, VB, right? Now, what do you expect for VCB collector base? So from here, you can write VCB is how much? VCB is equal to VCE minus VBE. Now this collector base, this is your collector terminal, this is the collector terminal, this is the base terminal. Reverse bias. That means 
this collector voltage should be higher than the base voltage. Yes. So VCB should be greater than zero. Should be greater than zero so that the collector phase junction is reversed best. Or in other words, this simply implies the VCE voltage should be greater than the VBE voltage. Right? That happens for NPN. The reversing happens for PNP. Okay. Now, let's have a look what happens in a typical circuit. You have this transistor, once again I am referring to an NPN transistor. Emitter, base, collector. This base emitter junction has to be forward biased. So this one is your P side, this one N side, this one N side, NPN transistor. So with respect to this ground potential, the emitter is directly connected to ground. So obviously that voltage should be large enough, positive, forward biased. So this is like connecting a battery, VBB. Some battery voltage and uh, you have some resistance. You have to select the resistance value as well. You cannot have any arbitrary value for the resistance. You cannot have some few ohms or ten of tens of ohms or say some uh, hundreds of ohms. You can't have like that. Why? Because there is some restrictions. And then obviously you have some current. So there is a there is one loop present over there. You apply some drop across this resistance and some VB on voltage, and then here emitter is directly connected to ground. So the loop is computed. So one loop is present over here. So you have to apply one. It says voltage law. Okay. And secondly, the collector base junction has to be reverse biased. So we have not connected any voltage between the collector to base, rather the collector to ground or collector to emitter. And remember that VC voltage, just now we have derived that this VC voltage should be greater than the VBE voltage. Okay, so that voltage typically that voltage is large, VCC. The supply voltage, typically this is large. And uh, you have some drop over there across this RC, and then what is left is nothing but your VCE. And that should be greater than this voltage, so that the device remains in the forward active region where the base emitter junction is forward biased and base collector junction is reverse biased. Okay. Now, before we uh, analyze that particular thing, uh, I mean, uh, so in this particular, case, uh, I will uh, switch between the, the device property and the circuit property. Okay. So before we analyze that uh, circuit model, so last day, hopefully, you can remember uh, we have drawn two such uh, characteristics. One was the value of IC with respect to because remember here for an NPN transistor for any transistor here. Unlike diode, you have more than one current, you have more than one voltage. Basically, you have three currents here. Emitter current, base current, collector current, and you have typically two independent voltages. The base emitter voltage and the uh, collector base voltage, or you can also call collector emitter voltage. Because if you know base emitter voltage and the uh, collector base voltage, you can easily calculate what is the collector emitter voltage. So typically, uh, I, I do have uh, two independent voltage. One is the base emitter voltage, second one is the base collector voltage or collector emitter voltage. And three currents. Or you can also say two currents basically, because if you know one current, the other, uh, I mean, uh, uh, these three currents are related, no? Mm -hmm. I is equal to IB plus IC, and that voltage relation you also know. So, although there are three currents or three voltages, I can say, okay, we have two independent things, two independent current, two independent voltage, something like that. And last day, we have plotted the variation of this collector current with respect to, uh, say, base emitter voltage. What was that? If you can remember the expression, the expression is something like that. Uh, the expression says that, uh, okay, let me write it over here. The expression was the collector current IC was given by IS e to the power VBE upon VT, and you can also include some minus one term here. Typically, this e to the power VBE by VT is very large with respect to one, so you can just neglect this. So it is simply uh, IS e to the power VBE upon VT. Remember that current. 
is a okay, it's a function of EV, decimeter voltage, that's great. And that time uh, we have plotted this for a particular DC, keeping DC constant. For, for a constant DC, how does it look like? It's basically, it will follow uh, uh, exponential nature. If my applied dB is higher than the, uh, the cutting voltage of that P injunction diode. So let it be say 0.5 volt or something like that. So when it, whenever, so it has been drawn uh, with uh, with a germanium, germanium kind of thing. So here uh, it is like 0 0.3, seems like that. So whenever it is greater than this uh, VD on voltage, uh, basically the base emitter is not diode, it's acting as a diode. So whenever it is greater than that, so it will uh, follow this curve. That is I, IC is equal to IS into the power of dB by PT minus 1 or forget about the minus 1, right? Now this was drawn for a given DC. If this is constant, now that time we have not varied. That time we have not varied the VC. Now, what happens if VCE, the collector emitter voltage, is also varied? Is also, suppose it is increased. Simultaneously, both are. Yes. Or let, let's assume that okay, my VB is constant for a given set, for a given uh, car. Suppose my VB is constant. Suppose my VB is constant, suppose let's consider this, this point. VB is constant, but suppose VC is increased from 6 volt to 10 volt. Then what happens? Here you can see, okay, the current drops. Right, you see the current drops. But, but, just think, suppose VC is increased. VC is, VB is fixed. Right, so. What is the formula? The formula says that VCE is equal to VCB plus VB. VC is equal to VCB plus VB. Now suppose my VB is fixed and VC is more. That means what? You have high, high VCB. High VCB because VB is constant and VCB, VC is more, that is VCB is more. That means you have more reverse bias. Now, if you have more reverse bias, then what happens? The width of the depletion region will increase. Okay. Now, the base region is divided into two segments one is the depletion region part, and second part is the neutral part. Right. So now, if that WB is a now having two different components. One is the depletion region component, so it will be WD and the rest part. And the decomposition takes place where? The decomposition takes place in the neutral region. Right. In the neutral region, decomposition with the electrons with the holes. So as VCB is more or rather VC is more, so the width of the depletion region increases. You cannot change the device dimension. If the device dimension is fixed, that means the neutral width is reduced. You have less scope of recombination. Right? You have less scope of recombination. That means you have less I. Right? You have less base current. And that, that phenomenon, hopefully, I have studied this thing in, in a basic reference course. That phenomenon is known as. Known as early effect, yes. it's also called base width modulation. Yes. Base width modulation or early effect. So therefore, I cannot say, I cannot say that base current. I cannot say that the base current is only a function of base emitter voltage. It's also a function of correct emitter voltage, right? And if correct emitter voltage increases. Then what happens? Increases and base current decreases. If this is more, then the recombination will be less, and so that so for that reason, I will be less. Less base current, right? Okay. IC will then be IC constant and what happens to IC? IC constant and what happens to IC? Constant and constant. But I think it will increase. What happens to IC? 
Suppose you have thousand. Sir, I don't have people. I see. I see maybe constant. Suppose you have thousand such electrons. Thousand such electrons crossing that particular a sufficiently large width. Say for example, out of thousand, let there be say 990. 990 electrons are ultimately collected. And the rest in electrons are recombined. Right? So 10 here, 990 there. So you understand what is the beta value? Beta we have discussed last time. Right? Now, now suppose, uh, once again, uh, because ultimately that is governed by the PV voltage. Okay. It depends upon the V voltage and obviously the uh, doping concentration over there at the uh, emitter state. Now, if V is fixed and if doping concentration is fixed, V is fixed, so you have say thousand, one second, thousand electrons crossing. Now, if the width of the base region, I mean the effective width of the base region is, is reduced, so you have less scope of recombination. Mm -hmm. Thousand, previously you have only 990 and 10, that, that ratio. This time, suppose 995 and 5, say for example. So, for a given VBE, for a given VBE, if collector current, uh, rather if your collector terminal voltage increases, that means the collector current increases, right? Okay, so therefore, and that relationship is a linear one. So, therefore, for this collector current IC, you have seen I C is equal to I S e to the power V B by V T as of now. Right? As of now, we have seen that I C is equal to I S e to the power V by V T. And remember, if V C is more, then you have less recombination, more collector current, and that relationship is linear. An additional component, 1 plus V C E by VA, which is called as the early voltage, VA, typically negative and very large, say 100 minus 100 volt minus 200 volt, okay. So that is known as the input characteristics, input characteristics of VJT. Why input characteristics? Because your input voltage uh, is your basimeter voltage, applied voltage is the basimeter voltage and applied current uh, is the base current. So the uh, variables with which I plot this particular graph are nothing but VBE, base emitter voltage, and the base current. Right? So, it is known as the input characteristics. Remember, here also, here also, this fluctuation, because all of these, all, all of these three different curves, this, this, and this, all of these three curves, they follow the XYB. Right? So, if I have some change in the input, input voltage, you have given change in the current over there, just like a diode, but remember that slope is not constant. It follows exponential nature. That means if I have suppose say 10 millivolt change over there, millivolt change over there, Suppose I have uh, say uh, 10 microampere change over there. Now, if if this point is shifted over here and here, if I if I take 10 millivolt change over there, then this change is no longer this change in current is no longer 10 microampere. Rather, suppose it is 15 microampere because it's an exponential curve. So to the power x, the slope increases as you increase x. Into the power mx, what is the slope? What is the slope for it to the power mx? Or rather, it is what x. That is what x. So as x increases, you have higher slope. So if I have the same change over here, 10 millivolt change over here. Suppose I have 10 microampere change in the current. Now, if this change is applied over there, then that current change is not is no longer 10 microampere. It is higher than 10 microampere. Let it be 15 microampere. Now, had this been the case, then our purpose is not solved. What I said at the beginning. If I change the uh, this position by some 10 degree, right, you should have some change in the output. Now, doesn't matter what is the initial position of the bulb, right, what is the initial theta position, theta can be at say 20 degree, 
I'll say that if we're 30 degree. Opposite theta, if I just once again consider that uh, analogy, suppose your initial theta, theta initial is equal to 30 degree and say theta final is 35 degree. And in other case, you have theta is equal to 45 degree or rather theta initial is equal to 30, 45 degree and theta final is equal to 55, 50 degrees. The change is 5 degrees. 30 to 35 and 45 to 50. Change is 5 degrees. But if it is not linear, then you should expect in the second case, you have more flow. Alright. So had this been the case, then your purpose is not solved. At least for amplification. And then it ultimately sets the the notion of what is what is called a bias. Where to place this curve? I mean, at which point I should take this difference, this delta v. If I take it over here, if I take it over here, some. If I take it over here, I have some other value. If I take it over here, I have some different values. That is one thing. And the second thing is that you have to ensure that okay. Even if I take it over here, within that range also, or that fluctuation, because you have some signal fluctuation over there, and that fluctuation over there, this is no longer a straight line, it's an exponential curve. So, this fluctuation has to be small enough. That means it gives rise to the small signal concept. So you have to understand the large, uh, rather the, the biasing and the small signal together. Where to place this? Where to take the slope? That gives you the notion of biasing. Where to place this curve? Where, whether I should place it over here, suppose, let me have some different color, yeah. Suppose, suppose this is one point, this is another point, this is another point. So whether, I consider the value over there, or value over there, or value over there. Depending upon that, I can have some different values of these resistances. Where to place? This gives rise to the notion of biasing. Right? And then, even if I place it over here, then change I can allow. So that, this fluctuation is considered to be almost linear one. It's no longer exponential, it's linear. Which gives the notion of small signal. I have to ensure that for uh, given uh, this VB, capital VB, that fluctuation should be small enough so that within that range, this exponential curve can be regarded as a linear one. So you can apply that uh, expansion formula. Yes. E to the power x is equal to 1 plus x plus x square x to x to the 4. So that higher terms can be neglected if that fluctuation is small enough. So the same small signal motion is also applicable over there. Okay. So that is known as the input uh, input characteristics because the, both the uh, current and the voltage, all of them are taken at the input side, base emitter or the uh, this uh, base current, IV. Then comes, hopefully you have observed this curve previously, no? Yes, sir. You observe this curve yes, in your first, uh, yeah. first semester. Basically, the previous graph was the function that we have been Which function? So this exponential function. E to the power x. E to the power x, yeah. Is, uh, I, I have written I b is equal to I s by beta. Minus 1. Minus 1, forget about minus 1 because typically this is very large. I s in the range of say few nano amperes even less. And I is in the range of few micro amperes. So 10 to the power 3, 10 to the power 4 or less. Right. So, but if we are assuming a small range, then e to the power x will be 1 plus x. Hmm. Then 1 will be patterns, it will be cancelled off. Then it will be equal to x. Huh, huh. So that, will huh. That, that, is, uh, that is when we consider the small signal. Okay. See, <laughs> We will come to that later on. We will come to that later on. Whenever we discuss the small signal model, right? Now, hopefully, you have seen this one, this output characteristics previously. 
Now for output characteristics, now for the input characteristics, for different parameter settings, for different DC, DC 6 volt, 10 volt, 2 volt, different DC. And when you draw the input output characteristics, it is drawn for different input parameter settings. Right, so if you just take a look at this, this here you have the variation of P with respect to VB for different VCU, 2 volt, 6 volt, 10 volt. So the parameters under consideration, they are the input parameters, input current or input voltage, IV or VB. Right, and the uh, parameters which are responsible for drawing the different curves, these are the output parameters, 2 volt, 6 volt, 10 volt. Now when it comes to output, uh, rather I mean the dependent volt, dependent parameter and the independent parameter, both of them are related to the output side of the transistor. Both of them are related to the output side. Output current and output voltage. This is IC, character current and the VCE, that is the current limit of voltage. Okay, and this is drawn for different settings of the input. I B is equal to say let it be say 10 microampere, let it be say 20 microampere, 40 microampere, 60 microampere like this. Now basically, here we have so we have studied this thing already. So here we have the three regions of operations. You have three regions of operations. One is known as the region where your Position of this valve is at extreme, say, uh, say theta is equal to zero degree, anti-clockwise position. That means your, uh, I mean, the valve, I mean, this tap is off. So ideally, there is no flow of the liquid, no flow of the water. So both the junctions, both of your basimeter junction and the collectometer junction, both the junctions are reverse bias. If both the junctions are reverse bias, typically you should not have any current. You can have some current, practically some current, because of this. Uh, we have some uh, leakage current, that part you can expect, right? But typically, you just uh, forget about this. Typically, that value equal to zero. So that means you are over here. You are over here, almost no current, right? And the second thing is that whenever Second thing is that whenever uh, your both the junctions, basimeter and the collectivity junction, both of these two junctions are polar biased. Both of them are polar biased. Right? That means you have placed your valve at the extreme, uh, how should I say, it's the extreme clockwise position. So let it be theta is equal to say let it be 180 degree. Right? And at that point of time, what will be the flow? This flow is ultimately dependent upon the cross section of, of that particular. Uh, if the cross section is this much, it depends upon the cross section. If the cross section is this much, you have some uh, water flow. If the cross section is that much, you have some other water flow. But you don't have any control. It depends on the cross section. Now, if the cross section is fixed, then obviously. In our case, the current is remaining constant. It depends upon the, the uh, additional circuitry. Okay. And that region is known as so previously when both the junctions are reverse bias, basimeter junction and the collectivity junction, this is known as the cutoff region. Device is off. Product bias, then the device is in the saturation region. Both the junctions are forward bias. Both the base emitter and the uh, base character junctions, both of them are forward bias. That means the device is on, acting as a closed switch. Here, the device will act as an open switch. No current, and here, closed switch, maximum current. In between that, we have the region of our interest, ROI. Interest in amplified design is this one. Active region, where base emitter junction is forward bias, and base capacitance is reverse bias. Right? Last day, hopefully, uh, I have uh, drawn a part of this curve. If you can remember, IB versus VCE. 
those were attended to the yeah those were attended to the last class IV versus VC sir IT versus VP IC versus VV, yeah, IC versus VV is that, that term, the exponential term, and yeah, IC versus VC, yeah, a part of the curve, straight line, part of the curve. Now, what happens, so IC versus VC, that means what, the variation of the collector current with respect to the collector temperature voltage. Okay, now if I increase this, uh, so obviously it depends upon the base current, so that was drawn for a given base current, given IC. Now, if I have more IV, what do you expect? If I have more IV, I should expect that? So less, less collector current. You have more IV. Suppose IV is equal to 20, so here IV is equal to 20 microampere, you have some collector current. Okay. Here also collector current, see VC voltage is increased from say 1 volt to 8 volt. This is drawn for IV is equal to 20 microampere. If IV is equal to 20 microampere, your collector current is equal to Okay, now here IV is equal to 30 microampere. You have if you, you have changed the value of so whenever I'm making whenever I'm changing this IV to be 30 microampere, remember how can I change this IV? Just by tuning the value of your uh, this bias voltage VBB. So I have made the bias voltage so that this IV is increased to 30, 20 microampere. And at that point of time, your collector current is given by 3 milliampere. Now, if it is 40 microampere, 4 milliampere, 50 microampere, 5 milliampere. So, that means a very good relationship. That means if I change IV by some equal amount, then the collector current also changes by the proportional amount. Okay, and then this ratio, this IC upon IV, that ratio, as you know, this ratio is known as. Which is known as the beta. I should always expect that if, if that difference is uniform, that is 10 to 20, right, then you should expand 20 to 30, then that this difference should also be uniform. So 10 to 20, that means just double or plus 10 or 100 percent change, 20 to 30, 100 percent. So here you can, you can expect that here also the change is by how much? 10 microampere, 10 to 20. 10 microamp change, 30 to 40 10 microamp change, and the corresponding collector current also changes by the equal amount from 1 to 2 milliampere, 2 to 3 milliampere, 3 to 4 milliampere, and so on. Now we are going to exploit that property, but that property doesn't, I mean, it is not present either in the cutoff region or in the saturation region. You don't have this particular property in the cutoff. In the cutoff region, even if you change the VC, there is no such change in the current. And here, in the saturation region, you find that the corresponding current is fixed. So you don't have any control. In one case, you have the zero current, no current. In the other case, you have the maximum current. You don't have any control. But here, in the active region only, we find that if I change the base, can also change this by proportional amount. That means here the notion of linearity is maintained. So that's why this region is also known as the active region or linear region. Active or linear. And whenever I would like to operate my transistor, I have to ensure that my operating point, that means where to select this, what should be IV, what should be IC, that that's the value of IV and IC should be there inside this active region, not in the cutoff or not. Okay, saturation region is when your both the junctions are forward bias. Both the base emitter junction and the base character junctions, both of them are forward bias. Then you have the current that is fixed. Okay, so hopefully this formula, I mean, you have already encountered this formula in your previous class. equal to beta times IV, where beta is known as the common emitter current gain. Typical value for beta is 100 to 150 to 200 like that. That means the base current and the collector current. Base current is 100 times, I mean the collector current is 100 times more than the base current. Right? So IC is equal to beta times IV. And you can also relate IC with the IE. Remember, 
the electrons which are uh, crossing this bismeter junction so or or the holes which are crossing the bismeter junction for pnp transistor and for npn transistor the electrons which are they were collected some of them are recombined yes sir. right so if i have say 100 such electrons crossing suppose 99 99 out of 100 they are ultimately collected so then your alpha is given by 0 0.99 that means it is close to unity but it is never, never equal to unity right ic is equal to alpha times ie see so if i have uh, uh, ic is equal to beta times ib and ic is equal to alpha times ie and ie is two currents the collector current and the base current ic and ie okay and this is the very popular relationship between alpha and beta alpha is equal to beta upon 1 plus beta that means alpha is less than unity and beta is equal to alpha by 1 minus alpha that is beta is much much greater than unity typical value for beta is 150 to 100 sir gamma and the gamma which point what is that gamma for <laughs> what is that gamma for Okay, now let's come to the circuit itself. Already you have encountered this circuit previously? This one? Have you seen this circuit? Have to apply KVL. So one loop over there another loop over there. So this is known as the input loop, this is known as the output loop or base emitter loop and the correct emitter loop. Okay. So V is the voltage, applied voltage from outside. This drop plus this drop. Because this is an input transistor, you have to ensure that this junction must be forward bias. Okay, so VBB is equal to how much? VBB is equal to IBRB plus VBE or VBB, uh, uh, VBE minus VB plus IBRB equal to zero. From here, you can have this particular relationship IB in terms of VBE, VBB, and RB. Okay. This, this input characteristic curve, this curve, and this curve, output characteristic curve, this curve. Remember, these are representing the behavior of the device itself. It has nothing to do with the circuit. This is the behavior of the device. So hopefully, you have done this experiment in your first year course. No? Yes, sir. You have done this, you have got this characteristic. You have changed the ID. From 10 micro to 20 micro, 20 micro to 30 micro, and you have observed and you have just got it on various kinds of PC. It has nothing to do with the circuit, okay? So, so it's a property of the device, right? But you never know which part. Whenever I am placing this device into the corresponding circuit. So, here what you find? Here what you find? IB is equal to minus VB by RB plus VB by RB. That is given. Now, if for a given circuit, if VB is provided to you, VB is given to you, is known to you, then you will be able to find out what is my given, or what is my calculated IB. You can calculate it simply. Right? So, there you have three different, I mean, a set of characteristic curves. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and have uh, infinite number of such graphs. It's not that after 10, the next one is 20. It can be the 10.5 microampere, might be 10.8 microampere, you have another curve from that. 11 microampere, 14 microampere, 19 microampere, you have so many curves. Right. But what is the exact value of this IB? The device will demonstrate properties like this. It will demonstrate properties like this. Properties like this. But which is whether it is 10 micro 
or 10.8 micro or 20.3 micro it depends upon in which uh, circuit you are placing this device what is the vv value what is the bias voltage what is the rv value what is the vv on based on this you have to find out the corresponding i okay and once you find out this then move to another important concepts before that let me show you the calculation in the output side output loop the output loop you have this voltage vcc drop across so what is that vcc is equal to vce plus icrc or in other words vc is equal to vcc minus icrc or ic is equal to minus vc by rc plus vcc by plus rc by rc okay so if the values are given to you vcc value is given to you vb b value is given to you rb is given to you rc is given to you vb on is given to you you will be able to calculate what is my ib and once you uh, transistor beta is given to you and then you can calculate the vcc so that is the method of calculation first of all all these values are given to you vbb vcc rb rc that means the supply voltage the battery voltage and all those transistor resistance values rb rc they are given to you so first you have to analyze the input side the input side you have vbb vb on and you have rb what are the known parameters this is known this is known this is known so you can calculate this id right then come to the output side in the output side what you have already have calculated id so you know ic once you know ib then you don't have any control over ic i mean you cannot select ic independently if ib is known to you you can easily calculate ic because ic is called dependent side that is the formula you know vcc supply voltage you know rc as well so you can also calculate what is my vcc value okay and that value of ic which are coming out of this equation is a property of the or it is due to the presence of that particular bjt in this circuit itself you can have so many characteristic curves i bit in micro 20 micro 30 micro 40 micro but what what particular i bit to select circuit you have position this uh, transistor and once you find out this ib you can easily find out ic and from ic you can calculate ic vc and then this given ic vc ib value you now you can place in that uh, transistor characteristic curve okay uh, you have no objection about the curve you know it very well ic versus vc three different regions operations here you have the cutoff region here you have the saturation region and our region of interest is this one active region or linear region okay now last time uh, in this particular yeah here we have got ic is equal to minus vc by rc plus vcc by rc and what now for output characteristics curve you have two parameters to deal with one is your vc second one is your ic right no now this particular so whenever you place this transistor in this circuit uh, the relationship is ic is equal to minus vc by rc plus vcc by rc okay let me write it down over here uh, it is ic is equal to minus vce by rc plus vcc by rc ic is equal to minus vc by rc plus vcc by rc now that is the characteristics of the 
ट्रांजिस्टर वेन प्लेस इन दैट सर्किट characteristics of the transistor when placed in that circuit that circuit is having some properties related to vcc rc and all okay now i don't know whether it's a transistor or any other device suppose suppose there is a circuit i don't know what is there inside i observe two parameters IC and VC. I observe the output current. I observe the output voltage. I don't know what is there inside this circuit. I am having something unknown to me. I am just finding out what is my collector current, what is my collector limit of voltage. And formula IC is equal to minus VC by RC plus VC by RC. Right? How does it vary? What is the nature of radiation? I C with V C. It's a linear. Linear radiation. I uh, Y is equal to M X plus C. Okay. So what is the slope? Minus one by R C. Right. Y is equal to M X plus C. There are two extreme scenario. When I C is equal to when I C is equal to zero. What is the value of V C? VCC. VCC. When IC is equal to zero, the value of VC is equal to VCC. So this is your IC axis. This is IC axis. So when IC is equal to zero, your VC is equal to VCC. So this is one point, right? So this point is your. So this point is comma zero. Okay. And when VCE is equal to zero. When V C is equal to zero, what is hello I C? V C C I cannot. That means this is another point. Zero comma V C C I cannot. So you have two points x one comma y one, x two comma y two. You can simply calculate the uh, corresponding. Okay. Right. And in between you have straight line variation. So basically, this is the line. So I don't know what is there inside this circuit, but what I understand is that if I have the defined sets of I C and V C, then it must follow this straight line, right? Now, I came to know the circuit, or rather, uh, within within that particular circuit, you have one device whose output current is your I C. And whose output voltage is your DC, and surprisingly, that device is having some characteristics. The device characteristics something like that. These are the characteristics. Car for the device. Okay, you know that. Okay, that should be the fluctuation. Allow the IC to vary from zero to VCC upon RC, or if I allow the VC to vary from zero to VCC, that should be my. Variation of this collector current or of this current IC with the VC. Surprisingly, you came to know that IC and VC, which you are getting, this current and this voltage, these are not independent. Rather, this is resulting from a device. Let's discuss something like that. So. Given a fixed IC value, suppose IC is given as uh, let it be let let me let me consider let me consider this corresponds to IB is equal to ten micro IB is equal to twenty micro this corresponds to IB is equal to thirty micro. This corresponds to I B is equal to forty micro. Okay, you have different I B value: ten micro, twenty micro, thirty micro, forty micro. Say for example. Now suppose you have selected equal to twenty micro ampere. How to select this? How to get this I B value? 
You have two parameters. One is your VB, second one is your RB, and VB on. So based on that, you can select what is my IV value. And suppose you have uh, tuned the IV to 20 microns here. I will spend 20 and you know that this is the characteristic curve for I is equal to 20 microampere. So this curve is due to the device property. This is due to the device property I is equal to 20 microampere. That, that should be the fluctuation of uh, IC with respect to VC when I is equal to 20 micro. But that VJT is placed in the circuit and if IV is equal to 20 microampere, then your corresponding VC value cannot be this one or cannot be this one or cannot be that one. Why? Because that device is placed in that circuit. So from IV you have some IC and IC and VC they are related and that relationship is obtained through this graph. So if if I is equal to 20 micro, you don't expect, you can't expect that uh, this, uh, although it seems that here IC is almost constant, but you can't expect that if I is equal to 20 micro, your VC is this much or VC is that much. Because that I bit, I mean that transistor uh, of uh, 20 micro ampere base current, this is placed in the circuit itself. And it exhibits a curve like this. This is a red straight line demonstrates the behavior of the circuit and this set of lines demonstrates the behavior of the device transistor. It's only one particular point they will be. Yes. So since the device is, is operated in that circuit, device is placed in that circuit, so the corresponding IP, IC, VC, that combination must hold good for the device as well as for the circuit itself. point intersection. So if, if I know my IV value, suppose this is 20 microampere and I know this is my straight line, so this is my operating point. This should be operating one, not this, neither this one, nor that one. This should be operating point. I can have some different circuit for which uh, your operating point could be this one. For example, as you have mentioned, the slope is given by 1 upon RC, minus 1 upon RC. Now suppose I would like to have, I would like to place uh, my operating point over here, say for example. I would like to place my operating point over here when I is equal to 20 microamps here. But in the given circuit, it doesn't happen. Why not? Because the point of intersection is R. And suppose this point is say R dashed. It's good for, it's good for the device because it is, it is, it is uh, lying characteristic curve, but not good for the circuit itself. Right. So what I need to do? Decrease the slope. Huh? Decrease the slope. Either decrease so you have two options. You have two options. Either so I, I would like to expect that okay, uh, this should be my R dash should be my point of intersection. Right? So I can have two options. Option number one is this one. Option number one is this one. Decrease the slope as you mentioned or whatever it may be. Either this one, this is one option or this one. I have to ensure that the point of intersection should be R dash. So, in case number one, and this is case number two, in case one, what I find, I have changed the slope. Forget the decrease or increase, just I have changed the slope. Right? Constant. This point is constant, this is the upon this one. Right? I can also other options like this one. The third option can be this one also. This is also possible. This is our third option. Yes. So for one and three, what you have? You have changed the slope. Whether it's increase or decrease, forget about that. You have changed the slope. 
right? And in two, second option, what we have done, we have kept the slope fixed, but we have changed the position. This is E upon RC, this is. We have kept this 1 upon R6 same, but we have changed the VC, we have reduced the VC. Right. So that now, now you can say, okay, suppose uh, this is your point of intersection, and uh, now you are not happy with this point R. You would like to make it. Yes. So what you are doing, you are just changing the, or you, are, you are playing with the circuit components. You are not playing with the device. You cannot, because once the device is there, you cannot play with the device. You can change the circuit components. Right. That is one thing. And then, suppose, for a given circuit, if I is equal to 20 micro, you have got R to be my uh, point of intersection, operating point. Now, suppose I increase the voltage, the base emitter voltage, so that the base kind remains, uh, base kind becomes 30 microampere. Now, if it is 30 microampere, obviously, this will be a point of uh, intersection. If it is 40 micro here, this is the point of intersection, so this is the point P, this is the point Q, this is the point R, point A, point B, so these are three extreme points, point A and PQR are the intermediate points. So, obviously these points are basically the intersection points. One is the result due to the device property, second one is the outcome due to the circuit property. And since the device is placed in that circuit, so both of these two properties are to be satisfied. And this point is known as operating point. And ultimately, if I just consider this, this straight line, one upon RC. And RC is basically here, the load resistance, so the collector resistance. So that's why, since the slope of this curve, slope of this straight line, is dependent upon the RC value, minus, minus one upon RC. So that's why, it is uh, this, this straight line, is also known as the load line. Load line. Because the slope of this straight line is dependent upon the load resistance, RC. Minus 1 upon RC, it depends on the resistance, that's why it is also known as the load line. Okay. So this point corresponds to the device uh, uh, when the device is operating in the saturation region, fully on. This point corresponds to the device operating in the cutoff region, fully off. And our point of uh, our region of interest is this one, from A to B, anywhere in between that. So I have to select, I have to select the other values like VV, RB, RC in such a way so that this point of intersection should be in the middle. Typically in the middle. Why middle? We'll understand later on. Not here, not there. We should it should not be over there, very close to uh, saturation or close to cutoff. Cutoff is one end, saturation is other end. Now you have to place it in between. So that you can have the maximum fluctuation, maximum distance. So these are the regions where we don't want to go. We want to move neither to cutoff nor to saturation. The transistor wants to remain in the active linear. So that's why it is placed in the center, in the middle of in the linear region or active region. So it is better not to place the uh, uh, operating point at, at point P not to place operating point over here, rather you place it over there, where you can have the maximum distance, both from the uh, Okay? Any doubt? Now let's solve one or two problems. Okay, so you have an input transistor with uh, the VV voltage equal to 4 volt, 220 kilo ohms resistance. In your digital circuits lab, you use a 220 ohms resistance. Here you have 220 kilo ohms resistance. Why? You provide a 5 volt supply. This huh? kind, so it has to be limited within in the range of microamp here. So that's why I told you that you have to select properly. If your IP is, I mean, if you select R to be say, to say 20 ohms, then uh, what happens? Your transistor will, remain, will move into the saturation region. That you don't want. Then uh, you can calculate uh, what is my VP value. VP is equal to VP 0.7 volt, for example. 
uh, and if uh, this uh, PV is equal to 4 volt and RV to 20 kilo ohms, then you can easily calculate what should be my uh, I, I, right? What is that? This IV is coming out to be 15 microampere. IV is 15 microampere. If you just plug in the values, uh, 4 volt minus, uh, I think it is uh, how much? Yeah, VB1 is 0 0.7. 4 volt minus 0 0.7, that is 3.3. 3.3 volt divided by 220 kilo ohms. That will give you a uh, 50 discard. If you'd like to change it from 50, so 15 microampere, then what happens? This is your Can you remember this uh, this graph? Can you remember this graph? Another load line. Another load line resulting from the input side. Uh, I mean this one. This one, I is equal to minus VB by R plus VB by R, right? So let me write it down. So I B is equal to minus VB by R B. So, IB is equal to minus VB by RB plus VBB by RB, okay. So, when 0, what is IB? When VB is equal to 0, uh, that means what, what is the value? 18.2. Have you calculated? No. <laughs> 4, 4 by 220. 4 volt by 220. You just calculate 4 volt by 220. 18.2 microampere. IB is equal to 0. What is the value? IB is equal to 0. What is VB? Simply VB that is 4 volt. So you have these two points, one here, other, other one here, <coughs> right? And for this, your IV is coming out to 15 microampere. So minimum value of IV is equal to zero, maximum IV that you can get out of this is 18.2, and you have got something over here at 15 microampere. Are you happy with that? 15 microampere or do you No, sir. No, not exactly. Since 0 to 18, 18 microns, for example, you should expect that around 9 or 8, eight microampere. It is very much close towards the saturation. That is not at all expected. That is a bias, you know, I have to place, back to place. I know that, uh, I mean, my region of operation should be from this, uh, this portion again. Which one? Sir, uh, that we are in by 18, 18 and 15, so what happened? That is the, so that equation IV is equal to minus VB by RB plus V. Where it is coming from circuit analysis, right? Circuit analysis, and now I can now I have the full freedom to change the IV and VB. I can make IV is equal to zero because these are the two parameters. One is IV, second one is VB. So I can have any cha any change. I can make any change. Say VB, say from zero to maximum. IV also from zero to maximum. So if I make VB zero, what is my uh, uh, your IV value? VB by RB. Then what is my uh, VV value? This is simply VV is equal to VV. This one, 4 volt. So these are the two extreme points. IV zero, IV zero here, VV is equal to VV. And uh, VV zero, that means IV is equal to IV max. So as long as, the, and remember this is a straight line equation. You have got two points. You can draw the straight line. Y1, y, X1, Y1, X2, Y2. If you got those two points, then you can very easily draw the Right now, once you have drawn the straight line, then you know that okay, if I place some 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 device in this circuit, so this particular straight, this particular, uh, I mean the corresponding IB must lie on this straight line. It must lie on this straight line, isn't it? What is IBQ? What is IBQ? Yes, uh, I'm coming to that. What is IBQ? IBQ is the value of IB obtained from this circuit. This is basically here. I should place IB. 
आई बी क्यू इज इक्वल टू फोर फोल्ड माइनस जीरो पॉइंट सेवन फोल्ड बाई टू ट्वेंटी किलो ओम्स दैट इज आई बी क्यू द क्विश एंड वेस्ट करेंट Okay, this is there. It is active. It is also present in the active, but I have the very small, uh, small room over there for fluctuations. So what I can, what I need to do? See, if we are equal zero point seven, you know, fifteen microampere will be my current. So change the R B. You have to change the R B. You have to increase R B so that the current drops. Yes. So I think it is not. In, it is already in the saturation region. So yes. On the edge, because we be on zero point seven. Ah, if you are on zero point seven, it's always zero point seven. It is not on the saturation. Saturation means what? It's uh, uh, close to that. I mean, uh, that is the maximum at eighteen point. There is eighteen point. You have to place in the middle. I have the cap which is carved. I don't know where it is placed. Right. So, but the current will be there. Current will be there. Current will be there. Current will be there. No, it's. Uh, Quiescent because uh, it's fixed. It's fixed. That means uh, time-wise there is no such change. Time-wise there is no such change. The constant is right. So that is the input, and then comes yeah. Let's have another circuit. This one. Now this time, what is the difference? This time you have a you have a resistance, another resistor connected between the emitter terminal and the ground terminal. You understand? But uh, gradually you understand what is the, what is the advantage of uh, connecting another resistance over there. But that's the calculation itself. No? You can do the calculation. What is what is happening over there? So this time once you apply the uh, K KPL over there, what you have? VBB is equal to IBRB VBB on plus IER. That kind of emitter current flowing through RE. Okay. What is the relation between IE and IB? What is the relation between IE and IB? Yes, IE is equal to. Emitter current is a collector current plus less current, so one plus beta times I B. Okay, so from that you can easily find out I B. V is given, V B on given, R B given, beta given, so you can very easily find out what is my I B, and that is coming out to be seventy five point one. Yeah, beta is given. Seventy-five. Beta is seventy-five. That is given. Okay. Yeah. Same circuit. Now we have to go for analyzing the collector emitter loop. This time we have VCC given twelve volt. VCC twelve volt. It is having three components now. Drop across this resistance, IC RC drop, this VC drop plus IER drop. That is equal to 12 volt. So IC RC plus VC plus IER is equal to 12 volt. And you know the relationship between IC and IE. Yes. IE is equal to. Yeah. If you know beta, you can calculate alpha. Right? Yes. Then VC uh, is coming out to be 12 minus. Uh, this IC into one point zero one. No value for beta is given. Huh? Value na hundred one fifty. Here beta is given as seventy five. Right? 
75 microampere, 75.1 microampere, okay. And the variation is from 0 to 12. Now suppose this is my uh, state of, I mean, a set of some of the uh, operating, I mean, some of the characteristics curves over there. And here, I see you have calculated, I mean, your IV was 75.1 microampere, beta given as 75. What is my IC? 5.63 milliampere. Right? 5.60 milliampere. And if IC is equal to 5.60 milliampere, then what you can do, uh, you just line you try to locate 5.63 milliampere here it is 5.63 right then accordingly you just project it over there you get the value for VCE rather VCE Q quiz and calculate meter voltage so this one is better much better because now now here the fluctuation is from 0 to 12 for the supply voltage it is variation from 0 to 12 and what is the VC value I am getting this is 6.31 is my collector current IC max it was 11.9 milliampere almost 12 you should expect that it should be in the middle what is my collector current 5.63 so 1.01 resistance to 1.01 right no 1.01 got from this from here okay. from this from here vc is equal to yeah. if you just plug in the values now And plug in those values, then you will be getting VC is equal to 12 minus this one, okay. And this one is much better, both in terms of VC fluctuations as well as in terms of IC fluctuations. IC is having the maximum value of 11.9 milliampere, close to 12 milliampere, and the, what is IC uh, quiescent value, IC operating value, or the VC IC value, uh, ICQ, that is, uh, is nothing but 5.60 milliampere. 12, 12 11.9 means 12, half of that, 5.6. It should be 11.2, uh, uh, 11.26 hopefully, double, 5.16 to 12.26, so okay, we're close to that. And here also, uh, the fluctuation is from 0 to 12, uh, 12 volt for the VCE, and here I'm getting VCE to be 6.31, so right at the middle. So this, this particular uh, uh, biasing circuit is much better. But you have studied, or you have observed, two types of biasing today. Unknowingly, you have understood, you have not understood, but you have, we have just introduced two types of biasing. And you have observed in the first case, you are not happy. The radiation was from 0 to 18 microampere for the base current, and your base current was, uh, the quiescent value was 15 microampere. You are not happy, it should, it should be in the middle. The second case, uh, you have inserted some uh, resistance between emitter to ground, and by uh, choosing the proper value for the resistance, you have now uh, to some extent you are happy because now uh, in this particular curve, if you just consider this curve, this is the fluctuation and now uh, you have positioned the quiescent point, the operating point right in the middle. That is the most important thing and that has to be established. And the second thing is that it has to be placed in the middle and the second thing is that that point should not vary. It should be a stable point. Uh, your yeah, Q point should be much more stable. That means you can have some fluctuation. Suppose you have designed the circuit, but suppose your transistor is not working properly. So you have to replace this transistor with a different transistor, having different beta. Or suppose the same circuit is operated at some different temperature. You are here in this seminar room with a temperature, say, 20 degrees centigrade. Suppose your device is operating properly. Now suppose you just examine the same thing. In the CAB ground, when the temperature is say 38 degrees centigrade, now you see that the circuit uh, doesn't perform well. That means if the temperature changes, if the beta changes, accordingly you have to select that particular topology, that particular configuration. That means it should be placed in the middle, that is the first criteria. And it should be stable. Stable with respect to the temperature fluctuation, stable with respect to the beta fluctuation, stable with respect to the supply voltage fluctuation, can be a supply voltage fluctuation. Say it's not 12, suppose 12 to say, say 11.5, then also it should be stable. It should not, okay. But fluctuation should be small enough. Okay. So, biasing, you will now keep it. 
Okay, they are defined by subiasing. We will discuss this in detail in the next class. They are defined by subiasing. One is known as simple Higgs mm, bias. Then another uh, 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 combination is known as the collector to base bias. Emitter bias. Voltage divided bias. There are so many biases in technique. So we will discuss in detail. But first of all, so this class is for understanding what is meant by biasing and what is the use of biasing. And there are different types of biasing. Now we will discuss different types of biasing in our next class.